special cases of the market model. Okay. Can we use our model of the market, demand and supplier, to look at some unusual markets? For those of you who don't instantly recognize that painting, it is actually the most famous painting in the world. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, painted over 500 years ago. It, is, it hasn't come to market for a long time and probably won't ever, but art dealers estimate that were it to come to market, it could probably fetch 750 million US dollars. So just in case it does come to market, I'm going to start saving. But the question is 750 million US dollars. Why does it cost or why would it cost so much? Well, let us look at the demand curve for the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the demand curve is downward sloping, which is to say that at a low price, there are many museums, art dealers, wealthy multi-billionaires, who would like to own the Mona Lisa? More than just a handful. As the price goes up, then it will winnow down the number of people who are willing to pay for it. What about the supply curve? The demand curve is normal. What about the supply curve? The supply curve for the Mona Lisa is not upward sloping as we would expect supply curves to be. Supply curve for the Mona Lisa is perfectly inelastic. It is a vertical straight line at one because there is only one Mona Lisa. If you were to visit the museum at which the Mona Lisa is on display, you will frequent, frequently see amateur and professional artists painting copies of the Mona Lisa. That doesn't increase the supply of the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is Leonardo da Vinci's original. And da Vinci, having passed away some time ago, is unable to increase the supply. There is only one, and there will always be only one. A higher price cannot call forth a greater supply. So the price is determined, really, by whatever number of buyers there are fighting over this one copy of the Mona Lisa. Now we know that because of economic growth, the world economy tends to get wealthier over time. And the number of wealthy people and therefore potential buyers increases. So, as time passes, the demand curve shifts to the right. More people are willing, and more importantly, able to buy the Mona Lisa. But because there's only one, then all that happens is more people fighting over that one copy. And therefore, all of that increase in demand has to be taken up by a higher price. And that has proceeded to the point we are now, it will fetch $750 million. Which tells you that if the world economy continues to get rich and even richer in the coming decades, the value of the Mona Lisa will keep rising. So bearing that in mind, now might be a good time to get your hands on it. You may start saving too. This is an example of a vertical supply curve. 
can we think of a case that might give us the opposite, a perfectly elastic supply curve? Well, digital subscriptions do that, such as a subscription to Netflix. When you subscribe to any digital delivery like Netflix, because it is digital, because Netflix's servers simply allow a new user, when sign up, to get an additional copy of the same things it already has, that additional copy is virtually costless. So it means that it is able to sell additional copies of its product at the same price. It is not necessary to increase price in order to cover the cost of a larger supply. So as demand increases, it can absorb all of that increased demand at the same price. It's a horizontal supply curve. If we can have a horizontal supply curve, can we think of a situation that might give us a horizontal demand curve? Let us take a look as an example at the market for copper, the world market for copper. There are more than a dozen countries that supply copper. And, you know, Chile is the largest producer of copper by far. But there are a whole bunch of, of, of small exporters of copper as well. For many of those smaller countries, such as Kazakhstan, for example, their exports, their production and exports of copper are such a tiny share of the market that their production does not affect the world price. Kazakhstan supplies such a tiny share of the world market that if it were to increase its supply to the market significantly in its own terms, if it were to double the amount of copper it exports, that would represent such a tiny fraction of the total world supply, the world price would not be affected. What that means is that if we were to think of the demand curve that Kazakhstan faces, that that particular supplier faces, it can treat the demand curve as if it's a horizontal line, as if demand is perfectly elastic. We're not talking about now the global demand for copper. That demand curve is downward sloping. We're talking about the demand for copper from Kazakhstan. Since any amount of supply is going to be taken up by the market at the existing price, we say that it is as if the demand curve for Kazakhstan copper is perfectly horizontal. It will have demand for any amount of its product, however small or large, at the same price. So that is how we get a horizontal demand curve. It's actually called the small country assumption that a small country does not have to accept a lower price to sell more or to be able to fetch a higher price if it sells less. Which brings us to these two gentlemen. Johan Blake on the left and Usain Bolt on the right. Why at their peak did Usain Bolt earn 25 times as much as Johan Blake? If you look at their average annual earnings at their peak. Usain Bolt in many years 
earned you know upwards of 25 million US dollars. Usain Bolt's fastest time, the world record over the 100 meters, is 9.58 seconds. Johan Blake's personal best time is 9.69 seconds. If you do a little arithmetic, you will see that Usain Bolt is 1% better than Johan Blake. Blake's time is 1.15 percent uh, slower so there's roughly a one percent difference in their ability how does that translate not to how does that translate not to a one percent difference in both earning ability but to a 25 times difference well the answer to that question is that usain bolt is the Mona Lisa. How many fastest men in the world are there? Well, there can only be one. There can be many very fast men, but there's only one fastest man in the world. And the thing is, the demand but the fastest man in the world is tremendous. Every company wants to be associated with the fastest man in the world. Every event wants to see him. And when I say every event, I don't mean every track and field event, you know. Usain Bolt gets invited to countries just to show up. He got invited to India to play cricket. He got invited to Australia to play football. This is not because his cricketing skills, which are not that bad, and his footballing skills are anything an audience in and of itself would care to see. No, it's because they want to see the fastest man in the world. So the demand for an appearance by the fastest man in the world is huge. Since there is no way to increase the supply, of the fastest man in the world, then the price at which that market clears is around $25 million a year. Johan Blake, at the time, the second fastest man in the world. Well, there's only one of that too, but the demand for the presence of the second fastest man in the world is somewhat less. And therefore, his service is clear at a much lower price. You know, 25 times as many people, at least, want to see the fastest man in the flesh as want to see the second fastest man. So, we have explained that paradox. So when we talk about what is economic value, economic value depends on relative scarcity. And relative scarcity has both a supply side and a demand side. Relative scarcity is driven by just what are people willing to pay for it? In the case of the Mona Lisa, quite a lot. So we see that the market model can be used to capture a wide variety of special cases of markets. <laughs>